get started. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight once again. Now, if you don't know me, I'm Susanna Girl. I'm a member of our Center for the Study of Foreign Society. And on behalf of my colleagues in the Center, I want to welcome you all to our second talk in the sixth annual Richard McCarthy Lecture Series. I also want to take another moment to thank Richard again, as well as Craig Howard, for sponsoring our series and continuing to support it after all these years. There are just a few details to cover before we kick off tonight's talk. Uh, first, if you're not on our email list and want to know more about the Center's events, please just leave your information up there before you go. There's also literature on the Center. Also, please don't forget to silence your cell phones. Somebody always does. Um, reserve the right to answer any phones that go off. <laughs> <laughs> Works better with undergrads. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't forget that uh, the last of the lectures in the spring series is three weeks from today, Tuesday, March 22nd, featuring our own Andy Weiss, talking about the Vietnam War. Also remember, our monthly Warren Society Roundtable meetings at the Hattiesburg Library continue next week on March 8th, with uh, Dr. Amy Milne smith talking about Napoleon and the Hundred Days. I also want to mention that our featured speaker is joined tonight by our mutual friend and Paul's colleague from Montgomery, Dr. Mike Pavlik, who's an Associate Professor of National Security Studies at the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies at the Air University at Maxwell Air Force Base. Mike has published books on the jet race in the Second World War, as well as a study on the Luftwaffe, as well as a book on the military-industrial complex and American society. For those of you with interest in those areas, I'm sure Mike will be more than happy to talk with you after you Paul's talk tonight. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce an old friend of mine, Dr. Paul Springer, at A&M University in 2006, under the direction of Brian Lynn, who many of you know from his work. Yeah, and I'd like to say what a, what a pleasure and an honor it is to be invited here. I'm obviously very excited to be here. Uh, it's fantastic just to be considered for this award. Oh, <laughs> I like to keep things fairly informal. Uh, it's probably going to drive Tim nuts because he's trying to make a videotape of this, and for that I apologize. But I'm one of those people that moves around a lot while I speak. I move my hands around a lot. It's very distracting, and for that I apologize. A uh, little background about me. Uh, I originally began as an undergraduate with the expectation that I would make my living in stand-up comedy. Uh, it turns out that you need to be not only funny, but good-looking. As my wife assures me on a regular basis, on my best days, I'm only one out of two. <laughs> Take your decision which way that one goes. Uh, so I, I figured, what could I do that I could get up and I could babble and I could put on a show and people would pay to come see it? And the answer was, be a professor. <coughs> Where it turns out, people pay a lot more for their seats than, than is normal for any of the shows that I used to put on, at least. So. Without further ado, I am excited to be here. I hope you're going to enjoy the presentation. I decided to pick the least funny topic imaginable for the purposes of this particular presentation, and I'd like to thank Susanna for that opportunity. You know, Floating me a really good one there. <coughs> Today I'm going to talk about the, the POW experience in the Korean War, and specifically I'm going to focus upon the individuals that chose not to be repatriated at the end of the war. Uh, a lot of people have forgotten that at the end of the Korean conflict we spent two years arguing about the negotiations of the armistice agreement, and the big sticking point was the question of whether or not we would involuntarily repatriate prisoners of war to their original countries. And that issue were almost 30,000 prisoners that originally indicated they had no desire to go back to their home country. And so it really was a major sticking point. Now, according to the Geneva Convention of 1929, you have to send everybody back. You don't get a choice, and neither do they. At the end of the war, you have to repatriate everybody. It never occurred to the writers of the Geneva Convention that people might not want to go home. In 1949, they rewrote the Geneva Convention relative to prisoners of war. And it does at least dance around the issue in the revised version. However, the revised version wasn't in effect when the Korean War began. And so the effect was to default back to the 1929 system, which had worked fairly well during World War II. In World War II, the United States had captured approximately 7 million enemy prisoners of war and had done a very admirable job of looking after them, taking care of them, and eventually sending them home with relatively good feelings about the United States as a whole. The mortality rate in American prisons during World War II was under 1%. So for the most part, we did really well. We shipped over 400,000 enemy prisoners back to the United States for their in internment. So we had a good idea of how to deal with hostile populations. And we spent a lot of time during World War II indoctrinating prisoners, 
teaching them about democracy, hoping that we could create some allies when we had won the war, as we expected to do, we thought it would be nice to be able to send home prisoners that had good feelings about the United States and might help the occupation forces that we expected to move into Japan and Germany. And that wound up being the case. Overall, it worked really well. There were a few problems. Number one, trying to indoctrinate prisoners of war is expressly forbidden in the Geneva Convention of 1929. What we were doing was patently illegal. We knew that, but we were willing to take that risk under the assumption that we were going to win the war and nobody would really complain that we had spent time teaching the Germans and the Japanese how to get along well with others. <laughs> it seemed like a good idea at the time. And we all know how often that justification is used. Well, it seemed like a good plan. And maybe it was. But in 1950, a mere five years after the end of World War II, the whole world had changed. And now we face the possibility of a war that was based more on ideology and less upon traditional means and modes of conflict. And the enemy was an alien that we didn't really understand. We could understand World War II. We could understand geographic aggression and the desire for the have-nots of the world to become world powers. But this whole communist ideology, that we weren't so sure about. We had some fundamental assumptions about communism. We firmly believed, we knew in our heart of hearts, that communism was inherently evil, that communism was bent upon world domination, and that all communists took their marching orders from good old Uncle Joseph Stalin. I don't know how familiar you are or aren't with the origins of the Korean War, so I'm going to err on the side of caution and give you a two-minute primer. The Korean War, go figure, happened in Korea. <laughs> At the end of World War II, Korea was, for all intents and purposes, divided at the 38th parallel. Essentially, that was the point that Soviet armies had reached in their invasion from the north before the Japanese surrendered. And when Korea was partitioned, the assumption was that each side would potentially hold elections, eventually the peninsula would be reunified. But by 1950, it looks like the country is going to be permanently divided at the 38th parallel. Nobody likes that solution, but nobody has a better one. Except maybe the North Korean premier. Now, Kim Il-sung has an idea. He thinks that because he's got a lot of Soviet hardware, a lot of Soviet supplies, he may be able to launch a quick invasion of South Korea, overwhelm the few South Korean defenders, and reunite the peninsula before anybody knows what's happening. It will present a fait accompli to the world, problem solved. But he can't do that without permission. So, he travels to Moscow, and he explains his plan to Joseph Stalin. He says, you know what? It would be fantastic if we could reunify the Korean Peninsula. That'd be a great plan, wouldn't it? And Stalin says, wow, that would be a great plan. We should totally do that. <laughs> Good idea. Isn't that the way you probably phrased it? <laughs> if anyone wants to translate it into Russian, that'd be great. But Stalin says, that's a good idea in theory. There's just one problem. At the time that Kim is presenting this idea, the Soviets are busy boycotting the United Nations. They're angry that the United States, Great Britain, and France have refused to hand over a permanent seat on the UN Security Council to the Chinese Communist government. We are still insisting that, in fact, the proper government of China is on the tiny island of Taiwan. Therefore, it makes perfect sense that they would have veto power of any significant UN activity. Soviets decide the best way to counter that is to boycott. And they're in the midst of their boycott when Premier Kim presents his idea. Now, Joseph Stalin does give the okay. Yes, you can launch an invasion of South Korea. He's thinking at some point in the future. Premier Kim is thinking next week. <laughs> so Premier Kim goes back to North Korea, makes his final preparations, launches the invasion in June of 1950. Predictably, the United States sponsors a resolution on behalf of South Korea that the United Nations should send forces to aid in saving South Korea from external aggression. If the Soviets had been present, they would have vetoed that.
that particular proposition. But the UN rules in 1950 clearly stated that you must have your designated representative who has been vetted and agreed to by the General Assembly in person to deliver the veto. And the last time I checked, it's about a 12-hour flight from Moscow to New York City. By the time the Soviets can get their representative back into the United States, the resolution has already gone forward. The United Nations is committed to sending troops in the hopes of saving South Korea. Now, I don't want to go over all of the war, so I'm going to summarize by saying, we commit troops to the South. General MacArthur, your hero and mine, comes up with the idea of launching an invasion at Incheon. This pushes the North Koreans all the way back into North Korea. Then we get greedy, decide to just roll back communism. Why not? We weren't doing anything that day. <laughs> the Chinese warn us not to get near the Yalu River. We get near the Yalu River. The Chinese invade. Chinese invasion pushes UN forces all the way back south of Seoul. And then we get a very slow, grinding fight. To simplify, it's a tag team wrestling match. <laughs> South Korea is fighting North Korea. They tag the United States and the United Nations. The United Nations comes in, beats up on North Korea. North Korea tags in China. China jumps in, free for all. Soviets laughing in the audience. <laughs> Absolutely hilarious as far as they're concerned. <coughs> if you remember anything from this lecture, it's going to be this slide. It'll be the only takeaway that you have. And for that, I apologize. Now, the prisoner of war issue. When we start pushing North Korean forces back as fast as we do, we wind up capturing almost 100,000 North Koreans in a matter of about six weeks. That's a problem. Prisoners, it turns out, need to be fed every single day. <laughs> and they're a bit of a security risk. They were, after all, just trying to kill you. And so what do you do? Well, you think, all right, we've got to dump them somewhere. Now, we've got enough experience with prisoner operations recently that we look at the map and we ask ourselves, where would be the perfect place to secure these people? I've got it. Let's pick an island in the middle of nowhere, off the coast of South Korea. And that way, no matter what happens, they can't get loose. And we'll just keep packing them in there. What you find when you study prisoner of war operations is that nobody wants to be in charge of prisoners. It's a pain. It's unpleasant. It's costly. There's no reward for it. It turns out there's no POW medal that you get for handling POWs better than everybody else. You don't win decorations. You don't get promoted for being in charge of prisoners. Nobody wants the job. And so they just keep dumping prisoners more and more and more into the compounds at Kojedo, where the North Koreans are being dumped, and once the Chinese get involved, at Jeju-do, a separate island that we set aside for the Chinese prisoners. Great. So, just keep throwing them in there. What's the worst that could happen? How in the world does a prisoner of war get a propaganda picture of Joseph Stalin? Somebody's not doing their job. It turns out, and we discover this quite a bit after the fact, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of North Korean and Chinese individuals who are deliberately surrendering in order to be sent to the POW compounds. And their goal is to continue the struggle behind barbed wire. They are supposed to organize the prisoners of war. They are supposed to cause disruptions. They are supposed to cause riots. They are supposed to demonstrate in the hopes of getting the foreign press to cover what they're doing. They are supposed to be as big of a headache as possible to their UN captors. Remember, nobody wants that job. Here's a reason why. And if you wonder how they get things like posters of Stalin into there, it's because they're deliberately smuggling them in with these individuals that are surrendering. They also are trying to organize the South Korean villagers living outside the compounds, promising them all kinds of rewards, engaging in all kinds of trading with them. What they discover is the UN has very little control over what's going on in the compounds. The UN doesn't have a lot of interest in what happens behind the barbed wire. For the most part, they are dumping people into these camps, making sure there's enough food being sent in each day, and largely staying out of the way. A great example of this phenomenon is this individual. You might you might have looked a lot alike, right? <laughs> On the left, Private Pak Song Hyong, Private in the North Korean People's Army. On the right. Vice Chairman of the North Korean Labor Party, Jeong Moon II. 
Go figure, it's the same guy. It gives you an idea of what level of people they're sending in to organize the camps. And the UN, sadly, the UN individuals that are in charge of prisoners of war never ask why everybody in the compound is taking their orders from a private. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> While we're on the subject of bad ideas, <laughs> here's a bad idea for you. You are a brigadier general in charge of the Koje Do camps. They are prisoners of war. They are engaging in a major demonstration. What do you do? Well, there's a lot of choices. Some of them violent, some of them not. You could just ignore it if you wanted to. But being the conciliatory type, General Francis Dodd agrees to meet with the prisoner representatives. They demand that he come to the compound and have a conversation about what they're upset about. That's a bad idea. It's a worse idea when you've got about 5,000 prisoners right behind the barbed wire, a really flimsy gate, and you don't want to intimidate them so you don't take an armed guard with you. Dodd walks right up to the gate, which the prisoners then open, grab him, and take him hostage. Can you imagine how embarrassing it is for the United Nations Command to have a brigadier general being held hostage by prisoners of war that should have been perfectly secure, behind barbed wire, not a threat to anybody? It doesn't go over well. As you might imagine, they decide that maybe they need to send somebody that's a little more forceful down to solve the problem. And the individual they're going to tap for this is Brigadier General Hayden Boatner. Boatner decides that's it. It's time to rule with an iron fist. Which is kind of what they were going for in the first place. Now, while Boatner's trying to organize his response, Dodd is signing a confession that the United States had used chemical weapons against prisoners of war. Chemical weapons being defined as tear gas, by the way. That, too, does not go well. That is a great way, actually, to lose rank and pay. Which is exactly what happens to Dodd. Dodd gets court-martialed, he gets bumped down to colonel, he forfeits $700 a month worth of pay, and he will not be actually reinstated as a Brigadier General until 1977, approximately 20 years after his death. His family turned it into a major crusade that it just wasn't his fault. It kind of was. <laughs> now when Boatner decides to reassert command of the camp, he sends in an awful lot of armed individuals. And these are some of the weapons that they find inside the camp. Now, it's understandable that they might somehow improvise knives using tent stakes that they've sharpened. But really? <laughs> really? Really? I mean, this is, this is an example of the compound being completely out of control. Another example of the compound being completely out of control is when they start to find prisoners' bodies. They start to find prisoners' bodies inside the wire. Prisoners that have been executed by their fellow prisoners for not being devoted enough to the cause. And at that moment, the United Nations says, okay, two things. One, we really need to figure out who the diehard communists are, who are the non-communists, and separate them. Letting them play together is a bad idea. Two, we really need to turn control of these compounds over to the South Koreans. Let's let them take care of it. Because we don't really want the job anymore. Let's let the South Koreans provide all the guard personnel and, and handle all the duties. And we'll just turn a blind eye at whatever happens. <laughs> we'll get to why that's a bad idea in just a minute. In the case of Koje Do, Boatner actually levels and rebuilds the entire camp. And this is part of the leveling process. If you look in the background here, you can see there's actually a village being burned behind the camp. That's where they were getting an awful lot of their bonus unauthorized supplies. And you can see they've now put in a lot more barbed wire, a lot smaller compounds. They're breaking up the prisoner population fairly well. As they're doing that, as they're running bulldozers in, they are finding an awful lot of prisoner corpses stuffed in every nook and cranny you can think of in this compound. There are an awful lot of executions going on there. But the United Nations by turning prisoner operations over to the South Koreans, have tried to absolve themselves of any responsibility. Unfortunately, they've done that, but they've also lost control over one of their most significant bargaining chips. 
By turning it over to the South Koreans, they're going to wind up creating a whole lot more headaches for themselves. Let's look at the other side of things. All things considered, treatment of, of North Korean and Chinese prisoners was pretty lenient. It's pretty good. Overall, I, I'd give it about a, a B plus, A minus. It's pretty good. The North Koreans, on the other hand, when they're capturing prisoners, they tend to find that prisoners are a big headache and they don't want to deal with them either. Unlike the UN, their solution tends to be to just execute them. As UN forces push north from Pusan, as they push north from Seoul, more and more they're finding executed victims of the North Koreans. And an awful lot of those victims are South Korean civilians. What they're discovering is that the North Koreans executed anyone they thought would potentially be a threat to their control once they had won the war. They're also executing an awful lot of prisoners, in particular Americans. These two gentlemen are survivors of what's called the Hill 303 massacre. In that particular case, an artillery battalion was overrun. Several dozen of them were captured by the North Koreans. A UN counterattack then threatened to free the prisoners, and the North Koreans executed as many of them as they could. If you look closely, you'll see that this particular victim has had his hands bound behind his back when he was captured. He's actually bound by his own bootlaces. And as we push northward, we find more and more mass executions of American personnel. This is not something that the United States had seen a whole lot in the history of American prisoner of operations. We really hadn't found a lot of cases of American personnel being executed. It is a major shock to us. It is a major surprise. This is the Taegon Massacre. Approximately 4,500 South Korean and UN personnel were executed in that particular case. Uh, who's looking forward to dinner? So, when the North Koreans did hold on to prisoners, they tended to take them on death marches. If you've heard of the famous Bataan Death March, a very similar phenomenon going on in Korea. Individuals are being marched sometimes hundreds of miles up to the Yalu River. And that's where the North Koreans have decided to put their prisoner compounds. They think that's the safest place, the place that the United Nations is least likely to be able to approach. When people can't keep up on the march, sometimes they're left behind. More often they're executed. More often their corpses are just left by the roadside. Hundreds of UN command personnel lose their lives through that type of activity. When the Chinese enter the war in force in November of 1950, believe it or not, prisoner of war treatment actually improved substantially. The Chinese are trying to convert a lot of prisoners over to their worldview. They want to convince UN personnel about communist ideology and the freedoms and opportunities that it provides. And they've decided that the brutality approach isn't very effective. The way the North Koreans have been going about this doesn't work. So they're going to adopt a completely different mindset. One interesting thing. The Chinese think that they will have a very receptive population in the African American group of prisoners that they've taken. As you probably recall, the United States had very recently integrated its armed forces that process was still going on during the Korean War. And they felt that a lot of the African American prisoners that they had taken would probably be open to some of their anti-American propaganda ideas. However, if you look closely at this map of one of the North Korean prison camps, you'll see that they've made the genius decision to segregate the prisoners. Now, it makes sense to segregate them by nationality. But to segregate the white American prisoners from the black American prisoners suggested to said African Americans that the Chinese were every bit as racist as they perceived the American government to be. It's nice to know that the enemy is not infallible. At least that makes me feel good, personally. <laughs> Treatment in the compounds was harsh. In many cases, deliberately harsh. Within the compounds, there is not a lot of supply. It is a very difficult area. Most of the supplies are coming across the Yalu River from China. However, the United States and its allies are engaged in a massive aerial interdiction campaign. Most of the prisoners are getting approximately 800 calories per day, which is not something that their 
their normal diet allows them to really survive on long term. There's virtually no medicine available in the compounds for the guard personnel or for the prisoners. There is virtually no way for them to keep warm. They're sending out wood details to go and cut down wood for themselves every day, but they just can't keep up with the demand. So we have prisoners starving to death, freezing to death, dysentery is rampant. There have been a lot of stories about torture within the camps. And, and there was some torture going on within the camps, but it's not as widespread as American popular opinion would suggest. In fact, there's an awful lot of soft indoctrination going on as well. This is that same camp. This is just a photograph of that same camp to give you an idea of how rugged the area around the Olive River really can be. One of the great criticisms of UN personnel that's presented again and again and again in the immediate aftermath of the war is that not one single UN prisoner successfully escaped from a permanent prison camp and returned to UN lines. I don't really understand why that's such a surprise. You would have to go on an 800 calorie a day diet, walk across a few hundred miles of mountains, through the mud or the snow. You probably don't look like the surrounding population, so blending in is going to be a problem. I don't understand why that was such a major, major criticism, but it really was. And the argument that gets presented in the United States is that in every war prior to Korea, Americans had had the, the esprit to escape, to continue to fight. But in Korea, there was something wrong with Americans. They just didn't have that elan. They just didn't have that spirit. And it caused us to begin to question ourselves. As Americans, as a military force, we began to wonder why this generation couldn't do the job that other generations had. In reality, it's an unfair criticism, but they didn't stop individuals from making it. Now, in the North Korean compounds, occasionally there were moments of levity. In this particular case, the North Koreans have allowed the prisoners to organize their version of a prisoner Olympic Games. And this is the opening ceremony. So these are UN personnel marching in, holding up flags of each of their individual compounds. They're going to engage in a series of athletic competitions. In this case, you can see there's actually been a boxing ring erected at the host compound, and it's quite a spectacle. And most of the prisoners were in some way, shape, or form involved in this process, whether it was the preliminary competitions or whether it was the finals being held at Camp 5. Uh, virtually every report of life within the prison compounds refers to these Olympic Games as something that they all found to be eh, fairly interesting, entertaining. It was a way to keep yourself alive, quite frankly. Now, most UN personnel fall into a category, according to the Chinese, that are neither progressive, accepting the ideals of communism, nor reactionary, actively fighting against it. About 80 to 85 percent of prisoners are usually classified as being in that middle group. About 5 percent are referred to as reactionaries. These are the troublemakers. They tend to be segregated. They tend to be singled out. They tend to be the source of most of the torture allegations. And somewhere between 5 and 10 percent are considered progressives. These are the ones that signed confessions. These are the ones that made public broadcasts appealing for peace. These are the ones that tended to tell on their fellow prisoners when they were engaging in some form of mischief. These were the ones that were largely ostracized by their fellow prisoners. The reactionaries give us a few funny stories. And believe it or not, there are occasionally funny things from the Korean War when it comes to POWs. And my personal favorite is what was referred to as Crazy Week, where in one particular compound, largely filled with officers, they decided to do everything they could think of to make the captors believe that they were going crazy. So in one particular incident, the officers had it planned. They made a whole lot of noise. Guard comes running in, tries to figure out what's going on. Guard runs back out. Prisoners all get out of bed, sneak out of their hut, hide behind it, make a bunch of noise again. Guard runs in, no prisoners. Guard runs back out for help. Prisoners all go back to bed. Help comes running in. Prisoners all there. Help leaves. Guard wonders. Guard leaves. Prisoners make a bunch of noise. Guard runs in. And they just did this all night long. And it was just little things like that that apparently really helped a lot of them get through the hardships associated with being a prisoner of war. 
One thing that really drove UN personnel, and Americans in particular, absolutely nuts, was that they felt they had been abandoned by their country. They were not receiving Red Cross parcels that they expected to receive. They were not receiving mail or other notifications. They <coughs> felt that they had been abandoned. And that probably contributed to a number of the individuals that chose to collaborate in one fashion or another. So, to summarize, I 1951, according to the North Korean and the Chinese negotiators at the armistice, they claim that they've captured 65,000 enemy personnel, and that includes South Koreans as well as all UN personnel. In 1953, they're going to return 13,000 prisoners. Now, if they're only going to return 20% of the prisoners that they claim to have, and they can't account for the other 52,000, that is an awful statistic. Now, in reality, we know that they were engaging in a lot of false propaganda. They were claiming captures they hadn't made. They were double counting people. But when you get down to the negotiating table, you really have to account for every single prisoner. And when we start demanding lists of prisoners as required by the Geneva Convention, they can't produce them. We begin to hold that against them. You said you had 65,000 prisoners. Now you're giving us a list of a few thousand. Where are our missing prisoners? The UN claims more than 150,000 captures. However, we discover there are a lot of doubles, a lot of people that were reported more than once. We eliminate those. That brings us down to approximately 124,000 prisoners that we're pretty sure we have on an individual basis. We start doing polling, and we discover there are approximately 23,000 that don't want to go home. For one reason or another, they do not wish to return to North Korean or Chinese control. And we discover there's another 27,000 that claim that they are South Koreans who were impressed into uniform by the advancing North Korean forces. We don't really have a way to prove how many of those people are telling the truth and how many of them just want to stay in the South. But most conservative estimates say chances are 90% of them really were South Koreans. So it would be a travesty to repatriate them, having been forced into uniform, back to the North Koreans, who we can expect will not treat them kindly for having been captured. We're in the midst of negotiations. We've been arguing for two years over what to do with prisoners. And by June of 1953, we think we've got a plan. The plan is, we will screen every prisoner, north and south, and ask them if they want to go home. If they do, fine. We'll ship them home. If they don't, they go to a separate special camp, a non-repatriation camp. And they will stay there for 120 days. Over the course of that time, everybody has the opportunity to try to convince them to either come home or stay where they are like a very bizarre draft system. What, what incentives can I offer to convince you that you really want to move to South Korea? How about no communism? <laughs> How about food every day? Turns out you're not allowed to offer them any kind of bribes. So, system's in place. Everybody's agreed to it. We haven't signed off on it yet, but this seems like a really good plan. There's only one person that's angry about it, and that's the president of South Korea, Singh Mon Rhee. And Singh Mon Rhee says, this isn't fair. You've negotiated all these things. You didn't even invite me to the table. I'm furious. Well, come on, President Rhee. I don't want to quit this war. We've had enough fun. Time to go home. Maybe you could just go along to get along, right? And Rhee says, you know what? <laughs> it's a funny thing. Remember how you turned prisoner operations over to South Korea? Well, boy, have I got a surprise for you. On June 18, 1953, Sing Mon Rhee gives the order quietly to every South Korean guard guarding the Pusan perimeter compounds, which are designated for non-communist prisoners, to just take a break. Don't forget to open the door on your way out, though. And 27,000 prisoners evaporate into the night. 
Re then begins to broadcast to the South Korean people to take in these prisoners, to hide them, to shield them, to protect them from being sent back to the evils of communism. This should come as a no surprise to anyone that the North Koreans and the Chinese are not amused. What do you mean you just lost 27,000 prisoners? <laughs> the crazy thing is, not one single member of that 27,000 strong POW population is recaptured. Not one. Every single one of them manages to disappear into the South Korean populace, which is exactly what we expected and wanted. But it's really hard to account for for us. Go figure, the North Koreans and the Chinese then accuse us of having executed 27,000 of their most communist members. No, no, we didn't do that, we swear. Oh yeah? Well, show them to us. Yeah. <laughs> Funny thing, <laughs> turned our back and they were gone, right? They're like two-year-olds, just, you know, you turn around once and they're, they're gone. So, if you want to do the math, and as a historian I was told there would be no math. If you want to do the math, they can't find 52,000 of their prisoners. We can't find 68,000 of ours. That's a propaganda win for them. They're actually able to make an awful lot of noise about this, and they are actually winning over some of the neutral observers of this war. Hey, we're no worse than they are. Those dead bodies, eh, well, you know, it's probably fake. So, go along to get along. We do engage in some early exchanges. Operation Little Switch goes from April 20th until May 3rd of 1953. We send back approximately 6,700 wounded or sick prisoners, the ones that are most in need of medical care. We get back approximately 700, so not the best ratio, but that's acceptable. I mean, they have a lot more than we do, and, and we got some of our most sick and wounded prisoners. What we also got were some of the prisoners that were most amenable to communism, who were being rewarded for being progressive by being sent back early. Great faking a limp, holding up a Stalin poster. <laughs> Operation Big Switch, this was the, uh, the, the attempt, the, the successful attempt, to send back the bulk of the prisoners. This is when we send back the remainder of the prisoners. And in the case of Big Switch, it's going to take a couple months to get everybody shipped back and forth. In this particular case, we send back roughly 76,000 prisoners we get back roughly 13,000 prisoners. Half of the prisoners we get back are South Korean, half are United Nations personnel. But, as you might expect, there are a few more surprises waiting for us out there. After all, I've got like six minutes, so I've got to fill it somehow, right? Here we see some of the operations going on. In this particular case, being the good folks that we are, we're handing out all of the supplies they'll need for the two-hour journey home. An entire carton of cigarettes, three C rations, some chewing gum, pack of ball carts, you know, whatever they might do. In this particular case, this group of prisoners was being transported by sea on an LST. Now you mentioned, I, I mentioned, you didn't mention, but I mentioned, that each side was going to get the chance to try to convince the other side, hey, you should come back with us, this is a great place. And here we see some of the communist delegates who are brought in to try to convince prisoners to come over to the side of communism. And it's nice, they've brought presents. They're nice paper flowers, nice artificial flowers, but you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to bring presents, you're not allowed to bring surprises. So we confiscate the flowers. And it occurs to somebody to try to figure out how those flowers were made. You know, origami, it's like magic. So they start to unwrap the flowers, and what do they find? It's a whole bunch of documents ordering the prisoners to come back, and if they don't, Here's a list of all your family members that we're going to kill if you don't come back. Way to play fair, communists. Way to play fair. Thankfully, those did not get through. Now, we're going to need a neutral commission to oversee this process. We can't trust you. You can't trust us. So, you ask the United States, hey, who do you want on the commission? The United States says, well, do they have to be people that aren't actually involved in the war? Yes, they do. All right, so... Who likes us, but is neutral in the war? Well, we like Sweden, 
We like Switzerland. Can we have those? Uh, communists don't like those ideas. They're not, not big fans of that. Well, gee, communists, who would you like to have that's neutral in the war? Well, we like Poland and we like Czechoslovakia. <laughs> <laughs> I will spot you a Poland in exchange for a Sweden. I will spot you a Switzerland in exchange for a Czechoslovakia. But we're going to need somebody that's truly, officially neutral. <laughs> and India steps up and says, we can do it. <laughs> we're all over it. We're neutral. And we're actually quite surprised that the communists go along with this, actually. We thought for sure that they would never agree to India, because India will clearly be biased. They have such warm, fuzzy feelings for the British. <laughs> they will just go right along with whatever the British want. Uh, no, it turns out the Indians actually play this as an honest broker. They really do take it very seriously. And we're kind of miffed, actually. We kind of thought that they would, you know, slyly go along with us, hey, old chap, right? No, not at all. Instead, the Indians set up repatriation camps, surround them with troops and machine guns, and we go, oh, man, you're not playing around here. And each prisoner is going to get screened. The idea is they'll come into this nice little meeting hall, have a little calm discussion, Day after day after day after day after day, individuals that don't want to go back to China or North Korea show up and get screamed at for eight hours on end. Mm. Threatened, screamed at, convinced, bored. It's like this lecture, but every day for eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> and no air conditioning. <laughs> Total nightmare, right? <clears throat> and our big surprise is there are some personnel that just don't want to come back to us. Well has to be a reason. There's 350 South Koreans that don't want to come back. And we can accept that. Maybe their family was on the other side of the 38th parallel. You know, maybe they got their reasons. But what kind of an American boy would not want to come back to America? Unacceptable. Can't happen. Not to mention one British guy, but we're going to just remove him <laughs> from the discussion. Because I don't know really diddly squat about him. So we're going to, we're going to let him go. There are 23 Americans that say that they don't want to come back. They would rather go to live in communist China. And now the recriminations begin. How in the world could the army have failed so badly that 23 enlisted personnel want to go north to evil communist China and not come home to mom and apple pie? And we begin to speculate. If you look at the New York Times clippings, during the time period of the Neutral Nations Repatriation Commission, you see all kinds of allegations. Well, there's 23 of them there, and we know for a fact that six of them are homosexual. That's why they don't want to come back, because that's acceptable in China. What? <laughs> well, we know for a fact that those 23 soldiers all have a collective IQ of 14. <laughs> that's why they don't want to come back. They've been bamboozled. We know for a fact that the Chinese have been brainwashing. And this becomes the buzzword of all the discussion. They've been brainwashing. Their minds have been cleared out. They've been zombified. They've been hoodwinked and bamboozled. No, it turns out, for their own reasons, each one of these individuals has decided they don't want to come back. Now that could be the end of the story. I could just stop with a blurry photo here and let you try to imagine for yourself why they didn't come back. But the interesting thing is, over the course of the next 15 years, from 1953 until 1968, 17 of the 21 that wound up going north returned to the United States. One married a woman from Czechoslovakia and moved to Czechoslovakia. One married a woman from Hungary and moved to Hungary. One died in China shortly after getting there of an undiagnosed heart defect, and one stayed in China all the way until his death. But 17 of these turncoats, these traitors, these defectors, these un-Americans, came back. And what they reported was, believe it or not, the Chinese kept every promise they made to convince them to come north. Because the Chinese didn't make huge promises. The Chinese said, if you come north, we'll give you an education. Different blurry photograph. In this particular case, they're standing during their initial orientation tour in Peking. Now, they're going to be sent to school together 
for months or in some cases years because none of them had an IQ of 14, but some of them really weren't the shiniest apples in the orchard. <laughs> They're going to spend years potentially learning Chinese so that they can function in Chinese society. They're all promised, if you go north, you will get an education, you will get a job. That's it. That's all you get. Now, if you would like to work for world peace, we can offer you that opportunity as well. We are a place that your voice can be heard. But they're not promising them riches. They're not promising them an earthly paradise. And these individuals got exactly what the Chinese promised. Now, some of them took advantage of the educational opportunities. Some of them, there we go, went to the University of Beijing. In this particular case, I've singled out Morris Wills and Clarence Adams. And the reason that I've singled them out is that these two individuals, when they returned to the United States, were nice enough to write autobiographies. They actually publish exactly why they went. Those two guys, after they get their education, and Adams, who had grown up poor in Memphis, Tennessee, and thought if he came back, the only job that would be open to him would be unskilled labor, but if he went to China, he could potentially get an education, had a measured IQ of 146, mm -hmm. decided that maybe his talents would be wasted back in Memphis. So he went and he got a master's degree, became fluent in a handful of languages, and went to work for the Chinese Foreign Languages Press, where his job was to translate foreign news items, foreign books, every form of foreign publication, into Chinese. And translate Chinese literature, classical Chinese literature, in which he got his master's degree, into English and other foreign languages. Not exactly the ominous communist that we were expecting. Eventually, Wills also got a job at the same place. Eventually, both of them got married. They found that Chinese communism was shockingly inclusive. Any chance anybody in the room recognizes this individual? Chinese premier, Chao Enlai. Chatting at a dinner table with Morris Wills, William White, random advancement, <laughs> Clarence Will, uh, is Clarence Adams, and others of these non-repatriates. Major surprise when this sort of stuff comes out. In 1962, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, we get this fine photo. That's actually Morris Wills carrying a protest sign. And not surprisingly, it's in English, even though the protest is occurring in Beijing. Uh, you can see the same thing happen in foreign countries today, right? Sometimes some of the greatest coverage is to look at the typographical or spelling errors that you find on these signs, often with hilarious results. Here we have Clarence Adams. He becomes fairly popular, strangely enough, in the ambassadorial society in China. In this particular case, he's at a big party at the embassy of the nation of Ghana. And this is the daughter of the Cuban ambassador. Cuban. Here's a letter that Clarence Adams' mother received from the Department of Defense. <clears throat> My last point for the, the talk here. When Clarence Adams was captured, he was listed as missing and eventually presumed dead. And the Department of Defense regretted to inform his mother that he had disappeared in Korea and then gave her a cash payment of $10,000. When Clarence was eventually discovered to not have died, but rather to have deserted and moved to China, they sent her a letter informing her that she would need to pay the money back. Now, legally, it makes perfect sense. But it's in proper Department of Defense bureaucraties. And so it comes across as a really cold-hearted, nasty surprise for this dirt-poor woman in Memphis, Tennessee, to suddenly be told, by the way, your son's alive, and we need 10,000 bucks back. But he's alive and living in China, and he's a traitor, and we have to hate him. <laughs> now, the one thing that Clarence Adams had managed to extract from his captors was a promise that if he could find a Chinese woman to marry him, he would be allowed to get married. And he, like many of the defectors, did just that. He wound up getting married. They had two children. This is his mother-in-law, uh, which it just baffles me that he looks so happy to be around mother -in -law. <laughs> It could just be me. I don't know. Uh, my mother-in-law frequently informs me that I ruined her daughter's life. <laughs> so, in their particular case, they came back to Memphis. They returned to Memphis in 1967. And Clarence Adams found that life in Memphis had changed a lot. It was not 
the racist society that it had been in 1950. It was a new form of racist society. <laughs> he found that he could not find work, despite being fluent in several languages. He couldn't find work. So what did he do? And one of those great ironies, go American capitalism, he opened a string of Chinese restaurants <laughs> and made more than a million dollars. <laughs> Love it when a plan comes together. Morris Wills, the other individual that wrote about his experiences, wound up coming back with the same education that Clarence Adams did and was immediately offered a job as a professor of Chinese at Harvard University. Mm -hmm. Insert your own. Communists at Harvard joke here. <laughs> I don't really have a good one for you. Now, the ramifications, because these individuals didn't come back, because of all the allegations, in 1955, President Eisenhower issued Executive Order 10631, commonly referred to as the Code of Conduct of the Fighting Forces. And this was a list that was supposed to be distributed to every American service personnel so that they would understand what was expected of them. They would never surrender if there were any options, if they somehow managed to surrender, not of their own free will, presumably by being conked on the head, knocked unconscious, <laughs> captured in some unknown way, waking up as a prisoner, then they would continue to resist, escape if at all possible, help other people escape. If they become a prisoner of war, they would maintain faith, no helping the captors. If they were senior, they would assume command of the other prisoners. If not senior, they would accept orders from the other prisoners. If questioned, name, rank, and serial number, nothing else. And they would never forget that they were an American, fighting for freedom, responsible for their own actions, and dedicated to the principles that made the country free. The idea was that this could be fit on a small card that every individual could carry, that they could be expected to memorize this, and that this would be what would get them through the future wars. And a lot of the prisoners of the Vietnam War say that this actually really did help. Believe it or not, it seemed very simple, but it was something they could understand. It was something that helped. Now, in case you're wondering, gosh, when all those individuals came back to America, why didn't they just get thrown in jail for treason? Why weren't they just treated like the turncoat deserter traitors that they were? Well, the answer, and as a proud employee of the Department of Defense, I can vouch for this. The answer is, the Department of Defense made a huge mistake. In 1954, they were so mad that individuals didn't come back that the Secretary of the Army ordered that every single one of them immediately receive a dishonorable discharge. That'll teach you. <laughs> and when they came back, after having received their dishonorable discharge, the first ones to come back were immediately thrown in prison by the Army. And the Supreme Court stepped in and said, hey, uh, Army, didn't you kick those guys out? Yeah. Then you have no jurisdiction over them, and you are not allowed to try them in any court of law. And what they did was against Army regulations, but not technically against American law. So every single one of them was beyond the reach of the United States Army. And a last little tiny bit of irony, several of them sued the Army and won their back pay for the time that they had been a prisoner of war up until the date of their discharge. <laughs> Every once in a while, there is something funny about prisoners of war. Now, I'm going to throw a little red meat to you because we're about to hit the Q&A portion there. And that is the question of whether we have some modern similarities. And I would say yes. Because in the ongoing contingency operations, formerly the war, formerly known as the War on Terror, you have an awful lot of detainees that have a very strong ideology that deliberately engage in attempts to resist their captors, in this case the United States, and you have a repatriation problem. Because an awful lot of the individuals held at Guantanamo are not welcome in their own countries. It's really hard to repatriate someone if the country you're trying to send them back to refuses to take them in. And that's a problem we haven't solved yet. Now, in some cases, we've found third-party countries that were willing to take in non-repatriates. So in one particular famous case, a group of 15 individuals from China, they are Uyghurs, members of the Uyghur ethnic group, 
were repatriated to Palau, of all places. Tiny little island nation in the Pacific and said, yeah, we can absorb 15 people, no big deal. The same type of thing happened in Korea. If you were a non-repatriate, you did not have to go to the enemy side. Most of the individuals from China that chose not to go back to China moved to Taiwan. A handful of them actually moved to India. India figured, yeah, we've got a billion people, what's 15 more? <laughs> Most of the non-repatriates from North Korea went to South Korea. But a handful of them also moved to India. See earlier joke. But there was no reason that they had to go back. And that was probably the fundamental lesson of the Korean War when it comes to POW operations. Is the question, if you don't solve the repatriation issue before you start taking prisoners, you may wind up with a whole lot of individuals that you don't want to deal with. And I will now throw the floor open if you have any questions. Or get out of the way. I'm going to surrender and, and be a POW to, to smuggle in these, these um, propaganda materials. Why would I not be searched for propaganda materials? <laughs> Well, it's partly just a question of the, the number of individuals being taken prisoner at any given time. Uh, the same way that you look at American civil prisons, how is it they manage to have drugs and weapons? I don't want to get into the more biological aspects of smuggling things in, but understand there are many different ways to get them in. And uh, some of them are obvious. I mean, you know, the okay. posters and stuff, it's just underneath clothing or sewn into the lining of clothing, okay, so which often happens. Because I'm thinking, you know, wouldn't you be strip searched like, before you no, went in? But they, they really weren't, though. It was, just, it was just very rapid processing. Now, some of the stuff gets smuggled in after the fact because North Korea and China both have active Red Cross organizations, and they are shipping Red Cross parcels, which are then, we're actually distributing to the prisoners like we promised to do. And a lot of times inside those parcels, there's an awful lot of stuff hidden. Uh, it sounds like it's cheating, and it kind of is, but we did the same thing in World War II. You can look at some great Red Cross parcels that were shipped to American prisoners in Germany that uh, you, know, you open up the, the can of powdered milk and it turns out that there's a hidden map inside there and you know, there's all kinds of decoder ring. And, you know, <laughs> it's really, it's really great stuff. And actually, some of the stuff actually did work to help facilitate escape. So I mean, some of, the, some of the, the cans of powdered milk actually had a saw blade wrapped around inside in case they wanted to saw through a, a barbed wire or something. You know, it, was, it was pretty bizarre. But it was considered perfectly acceptable to escape. So you know, as long as you didn't hurt anybody in the, in the process. Yes, ma'am. Um, you mentioned about how people were dying on the death marches yes. up to North Korea, but what was the death rate for North Koreans and Chinese being sent to the UN death uh, the, the UN the, compounds? The compounds, like were they being, um, I know they were probably being transported by a ship, but were people dying or? The mortality rate in the, in the, the transit to the UN compounds, I mean, the most dangerous time as a prisoner is, is the moment of capture and, and the moment of processing. So it, it's hard to say, oh, here is the exact number that, that got caught but not, uh, not sent forward. The mortality rate once they reached the UN compounds was a little under 3%. And the mortality rate for UN prisoners in northern compounds is about 38%. Uh, to put things in context, mortality rate for Americans in German POW compounds in World War II was 1.1%. Uh, mortality rate for Germans in American compounds was under 1% by quite a bit. I mean, it's, Okay, uh, just to really freak people out, 90% uh, of all Soviet prisoners captured by the Germans did not survive World War II. Uh, about, about the same in the other direction. So generally the rule in POW operations is, if you're nice to mine, I'll be nice to yours. Uh, and Korea is a case where that's not true. Americans in Japanese hands, it's not true. The mortality rate for Americans in Japanese hands is about 27%. Uh, but for the most part, that's the usual rule. And the UN is, is playing pretty straight here. They're actually doing the best they can. They also just have a far more robust logistical system. They have the ability to transport prisoners and feed them. They have medical supplies. They have medical supplies. In a couple of cases, Syngman Rhee actually cuts off food shipments to the compounds, and the UN just ships food instead. Fine. You, know, you want to cause headaches? Fine. We'll just do it. Uh, Rhee was largely doing that to prove a point that you need me as much as I need you. Uh, and, and he was right. It was annoying, but it, it wasn't killing. Sir? Uh, don't you think it was probably in their best interest to treat the uh, prisoners who refused repeat repatriation in a, in a fine way, a good, uh, meaningful way, and, and to add a little perspective to it during that very same period? Over 30 million Chinese starved to death in the, uh, Great Leap Forward. 
And actually, the, the prisoners that wrote about their experiences, the ones that weren't repatriated but then eventually came back, they admitted that they were actually still getting special treatment. That they were, uh, you know, they never faced starvation. They never really lived like a Chinese peasant, even though that's what they were told. They were told, you will live as a, as a you know, just an ordinary Chinese individual. But in reality, they admitted, no, we got more food. It wasn't a lot of food because there just wasn't much to go around. But they got a lot of privileges solely because they were foreigners. Would you also uh, give your opinion on the current thoughts to whether the United States used biologic warfare in the Korean War? I saw one uh, special on PBS 10 or 15 years ago, and they had the Joseph Needham, the uh, British communist sympathizer, and then I subsequently read his biography. Uh, how do you think that all checks out now? My opinion. Uh, this is not the DOD opinion. This is not the opinion of the federal government of the United States Air Force. Just want to get that disclaimer out there. No. Uh, my opinion is no. We didn't use biological warfare for a couple reasons. One, I don't think we did because I just don't find the evidence compelling that we did. There were dozens of Air Force officers that signed admissions to having done it under duress, uh, but I don't find compelling evidence that we did. Part of the reason that I don't think we did is because we knew by 1950 that biological warfare just was not efficient. It just didn't work. We hadn't sufficiently weaponized things that could be truly lethal. And that's really still true today. Uh, because bioweapons just don't work. They're very scary, and, and the, the notion of them horrifies us and allows us to create movies and television shows. But they don't work because they just take too long, quite frankly. And when you're engaging in, in warfare where you want a rapid kinetic effect, waiting, okay, we've got a 36-hour incubation period, and then, okay, a week before you start to show symptoms, and it just doesn't function. It just, it's not advantageous to us. Now, bioterror, bioterror scares the heck out of me. Uh, because bioterror, if you're a terrorist, you can afford to wait. You, you're not that worried about it. But the types of things that have been weaponized, they just don't have very good battlefield application. They're not like chemical warfare. And the allegations were largely about biological weapons, about bacteriological warfare. But I, I just don't find the, the evidence compelling that we did. But that's, that's just my opinion, though. Yes, ma'am? So what do we know about the 17 that returned? What were the motivations for returning to the U.S. eventually? Do we know that? Yeah. Actually, most of them say they just weren't happy in China. It turns out the life of a Chinese peasant, even if you're getting special privileges, <laughs> is not pleasant. And, and that's really, well, they, you know, some of them say, well, I just really missed home. I, just, I missed my family. I hadn't seen them. So I decided to come back. But an awful lot of them say, wow, you know, you told me you were going to give me a job. You just didn't tell me it was going to be a boring, unpleasant job. <laughs> <laughs> you don't judge me. We laugh about it. But there were, there were a handful of them that just could not learn Chinese, no matter how hard they tried. So here you are. You're in China. You have no marketable skills that the Chinese need whatsoever. You're, you're 21 years old. You know, you, 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 they were all, only one of them was a draftee, the rest of them were all volunteers, which kind of tells you something about them in, in 1940s American society. It's just, you know, I know the Army's a high society position now, but it wasn't, largely, largely it was not considered the, the best job as an 18-year-old then. And they just said, you know, it turns out when they put you to work in unskilled labor on a farm, and the only way you can communicate with people is point and, you know, point and shove, it was miserable. And so when they, when they communicated to the Chinese, I want to go home, the Chinese tried to convince them not to go home. And the other defectors often tried to convince them not to go home. And when they said, no, I really want to go home, the Chinese put them in touch with the British Embassy, and the British walked them out into Hong Kong. And the, the Chinese didn't actually try to stop them. They tried to convince them otherwise. But they, they put no obstacles in their way to coming home, which is a, a big surprise for me, really. You know, I was raised to fear and hate communists, but uh, and I, I still do, still do. <laughs> but, it, it was a surprise to me that they really did keep all the promises because they didn't make really overarching promises. And so they put them to work in factory labor. And those that showed aptitude were able to, to get these other more high-profile, high-status jobs. But it turns out, in a communist society, no matter how high-profile your job is, you don't get a lot of privileges. You don't become wealthy. And that's Some of them said they became disillusioned by communism, that they felt that uh, in the case of Clarence Adams in particular, the, the African-American man from Memphis, he said he found the Chinese were every bit as racist as what he experienced in Memphis. That, that you know, he had a number of incidents where, where he was kicked or pushed or spit on or uh, you know, pointed at or, or whatever. He was uncomfortable with that. Others of them said they became disillusioned with communism because they felt that it wasn't this pure society that they'd been led to believe. They felt 
that in fact there were people that were still living high and the average person wasn't, or they weren't getting their opportunity to work for peace. But what it really boiled down to is a lot of them missed home, and it turns out that the life in America, even for the lowest economic classes, is pretty good, comparatively speaking. Sir? Um, you showed a picture of them with uh, Joe and I. To what extent were these guys used as publicity or just PR stuff? Rather, I mean, you know, you'd make the argument that they were specially treated. You know, is that because they were indeed, you know? Well, the interesting thing is they were they were largely kept out of sight. Uh, the, the United States had no idea what happened to these individuals. For about the, the first two years, they were just gone, which led to a lot of rampant speculation about why they had gone and what happened to them. You know, we kind of thought, oh, these guys are going to be a propaganda spectacle, and they really weren't. They, they really just kind of left them alone and didn't try to use them that way. However, they, I mean, they did put them to some interesting uses. Morris Wills, being six foot tall, was the tallest guy on the Peeping college basketball team. Uh, and, and it's no joke. If there's pictures of him towering over the rest of them. Uh, that, that was, you know, it, he, he, was, he said for the first time in his life, I was a sports star. It was fantastic. I loved it. And, and so they, they, they do have cases like that. And they're, they're fairly well known in some circles of Chinese society. But they're not getting used for the kind of propaganda that we expected. Now, Clarence Adams is a special case there. Because in 1966, Clarence Adams created a series of radio broadcasts that were designed to be broadcast to American service personnel in South Vietnam. And what he called for was for African American soldiers to quit the war, go home, and fight against racism in the United States. He did not technically advocate for them to desert or go AWOL. He did not technically call for armed insurrection against the American government. But that was the way it was perceived in the United States. And there were an awful lot of people waiting to talk to him, including the House Un-American Activities Committee, which dragged him up in front, of, uh, in front of them for a series of hearings, which he was able to quickly shut down by essentially saying, look, you know, I, I did what I did, but the reason I did it was racism in America. The reason I did it was because I wasn't going to get these opportunities. They gave me what they said they would give me, and you gave me a dishonorable discharge. So they, they dropped the case. They, they let it go. I just want to invite everyone to ask additional questions after this, and join me in thanking Dr. Spring for his talk tonight.